All right, let's get rolling. We got some time to make up. Um, uh, hi, my, na my name is Nate Ryan. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me have some of your time to show you a little bit about Lua tonight. Um, I bumped into Jay a while ago at one of the Covis uh, that he's talking about, and we were just kicking it around, and I didn't even know of the Omaha Dynamic Language User Group at the time. Um, I'm typically using uh, Microsoft and other, uh, I don't know, handcuff languages, I'll call them. Um, most of my time, but um, last year, um, well, I've been working with Corona SDK for a couple of, over two years now. Uh, I'm actually an ambassador uh, for Corona SDK, so I get some early looks at stuff and um, I try to evangelize it. It's a great tool for 2D uh, game development cross-platform, um, if that's your, uh, that's your thing. But um, the key part is that they use Lua, and so regardless of um, the engine using it or whatnot. There's kind of two, two key components for Lua, and we'll, we'll get into some more of this. Um, but uh, my hope tonight is to just uh, visit with you guys, uh, share a little bit about Lua, and hopefully um, give you enough to say, hey, I might want to look into this language more. Um, it's it's a really fast, embeddable language. Um, it's dynamic. Um, and hopefully just give you a taste of it. Um, I've got some slide decks to go through. Um, you know, Jay told me make sure we keep it about Lua. I'm going to use, um, if you guys wanted to download something or uh, write some Lua while we're sitting here talking or whatever, there's a number of interpreters out there that you can go pull down. Um, I'm going to just use Corona because that's what we have the Corona SDK group here too. So I'm going to use their interpreter and their window to write some Lua code. But everything we'll write in, in there short of a few Corona tidbits. We're just going to focus on the Lua side. Um, I know a lot of people in this room have a lot of different experience in a lot of different languages, so it would be awesome if you guys shout out uh, some comments, feedback on what you're seeing in here. Is it similar to other languages, that kind of thing. It makes it really useful to learn some of this because I don't get my hands in uh, everything. So that really helps the cause. Um, again, just to give you a quick rundown of me, um, I worked on, besides my day job, where I'm a director of applications development for Farm Credit Services of America, and I lead a team of development over there. Um, I also worked on 16 Corona SDK apps last year um, outside of that. And so um, that's a testament to the Lua and what makes that possible is that I can do that kind of thing. And, and, and most of these apps are on iPad, iPhone, Android, you know, all at once. So. Um, that's a testament to the language giving me, you know, that kind of horsepower to go and crank through that. Um, varying degrees of success. Some of these are client apps. I got a few chunks of change to buy some goodies with. Uh, some of these crash and burn miserably. Um, it's just an ongoing evolution. Um, I like to mention, if some people have seen me speak before, I always like to mention my Detroit Lions one uh, because I put in a a banner on my wall. It's the first one that I got kicked out of the app store and banned by the NFL because I didn't have expressed written consent on the uh, NFL logos and Lions stuff. It was just, it was purely fan, purely free. It was just a Lions schedule with players, uh, little rag dolls that updated every week with whoever we were playing so you could slam them around on the screen and just torment the Chicago Bears, that kind of thing. But it got banned. So right after I hit 15,000 downloads, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, my Twitter account is fully croisoned. Uh, that's my little side effort that I run through things. Um, and then Corona Labs is a great resource uh, for anything Corona, and uh, they put out a lot of Lua stuff too. Uh, let's see. Some of these I'm going to skip because I kind of just over. I use some of these for a Corona presentation. We're not going to focus on that, but uh, in short, Corona does cross platform development. You use Lua, write your code all in that, and you can build and deploy to iOS, Android, Kindle, Nook, uh, pretty much everything uh, except Windows at this point. And who knows, that may be coming. Uh, so who else is using uh, Lua? Um, if you go out to the lua.org Lua website, you can actually go to their About page and look, and they have a lot of the premier listings out there, but you'll see a lot of AAA games. And if you just search for who's using Lua, um, there's actually a wiki site that's keeping track of it, and you probably go, wow, uh, when you see all the titles out there, because it's uh, pretty much anything in the gaming industry, but this language is great to uh, speed up rapid development and embed it into um, other areas, too. There's a LaTeX interpreter that has uh, Lua embedded in it. What's that? A LaTeX interpreter 
Oh, okay. Awesome. Uh, let's see, skip this one, Corona. This is just a little bit of the Corona stack, but you can see where Lua fits in the mix here. So uh, down here, low level, we got our native uh, uh, operating systems, and then uh, the Corona engine sits in there. And then you actually write your, uh, through Lua, and you touch the Corona API. So this would be similar to change the stack out of your game engine of choice, um, anything. That's pretty much the stack uh, that you'll be working with. Okay, so Lua, um, yeah, created in 1993. So this is the 20 year anniversary um, this year. It's one of the fastest, if not the fastest, interpretive languages. Uh, there's a lot of benchmarking out there between you know, uh, JavaScript tests and uh, uh, what's the other one that's up in the top all the time uh, for these? Uh, not sure, but Lua is always right there in the top. It's tremendously powerful, especially for screaming through uh, strings and text. Uh, you can stick the size of a book into a string variable and whip through that thing in, in super fast time. Let's see. So this is the, the guy we can thank, uh, him and a couple others, but Roberto uh, Luris Lomischke, who I almost got to meet, but I missed him by one day. Um, he actually sits on the panel now of the Board of Advisors for Corona, and so he helps them with optimizations and uh, different things with the, the Corona SDK. Um, I don't know, it's pretty neat having access to that. Um, his, whole, his whole deal started with a guy named uh, Waldemar and Luis, uh, these three guys in uh, Brazil, and they, uh, they built it for an in-house project to speed up their development. And so they're really trying to just separate uh, you know, what C does really great down by the metal and all the sheer horsepower side of the world, um, and then the rapid development and uh, handling uh, you know, uh, developers that didn't need to be working with the third parties or worrying about memory management and that side of stuff. So that's why Lua came to be, and they built it for an in-house project, and then they ended up releasing it open source, and now it's just blown up uh, relatively huge. So some features about Lua, and you guys can see where these cross over with stuff you work with, but it's definitely dynamically typed, so you know, just like JavaScript. It's extremely fast and efficient. It has first class functions, so that means we get uh, you know, the ability to pass these around as variables, uh, call functions, return functions, uh, pass them as parameters to other functions, uh, neat stuff like that. And then we're gonna spend some time tonight, uh, one of the big areas to just give you a taste is uh, this notion of tables. It's probably my single favorite uh, part of Lua and working with it for the last two years because uh, it's kind of like the end all. Um, if you need an associative array, a dictionary, a list, a queue, a stack, an object, whatever you want in Lua, it's a table. And as you dig into this language more and more, you'll find out that everything is a table in Lua. So if you require in uh, additional code from a separate file, uh, that's gonna, you're gonna set that to a variable, and we'll look at some code here in a little bit. I just don't wanna flip back and forth too much, but wow, I'll show you that. But when you require that uh, code in, as you start to modularize this, uh, you'll find out that that gets set into a variable and all the functions inside that other file uh, become you know, keys of a table that you'll end up calling. And it's pretty amazing as you start working with it, and all of a sudden you'll realize, all I'm doing is working with some variants of tables, and we'll go through a lot of that. Uh, the footprint for Lua is uh, compressed. It's only 245K. It's 960K uncompressed, so it will fit on an old floppy disk if you have one of those laying around. Um, I just threw out a whole box. Uh, the source code for Lua is right around uh, 20,000 lines of C, and that's it. Um, it can run on any platform with ANSI C, so again, highly attractive, and so you're seeing it used. Um, if you're following any of the do-it-yourself kits and all that with all these neat uh, um, Raspberry Pi and Dell has a card out now, um, a lot of them are pumping that stuff off. If you can run ANSI C, you can embed Lua and write Lua against that, and so you're seeing this turn up in literally everything from not just a, a game HUD or a, a wow screen or an add-in or a plug-in, but it's actually driving toaster ovens, microwaves, refrigerators, uh, smart 
you know, housing, lamps. Um, it's starting to show up uh, in those kind of items. So if you've got a device smart enough that has hardware that can run NCC, you can end up using uh, Lua no problem. And it works great as a standalone language too. So that's the other thing that's important about Lua. It's not just uh, an embedded extension of an existing language. It'll stand on its own also. Let's see, uh, spaces do not matter. And again, I'm just gonna kind of whip through these slides and then we'll crack code open and play around with some examples in there. But uh, spaces do not matter in Lua. So um, I think that's similar to JavaScript. You guys can shout out. I'm not uh, a JavaScript expert, but if you wanted to, you could press that whole file down right you know, in line and it'll still work. Uh, Semicolon is optional, so at the end of the line, you can leave it off or add it. Um, I tend to add it just because of some of the other work I'm doing. So sometimes, I don't know, you'll call my bluff on that when we look in the code, I guess, but I left some off. Uh, Lua is definitely case sensitive. Um, we got eight basic types, and we'll whip through those. So we've got a nil, uh, a boolean, uh, number, string, user data, function, uh, thread, and table. So between these eight types, and I think there's 16 reserved words, uh, you know Lua, so welcome. Uh, let's see, comments, and, and again, we'll go through these in code, but the, the way you comment in Lua is you use the double bracket, double dash, a uh, little example there, and there's kind of a cool trick you can do with that to do blocks at a time that, that we'll be doing when we walk through it. Um, you can do multiple assignments. This is really cool, especially if you're coming from, uh, I don't know, C sharp or something like that where you can't do a maneuver like that. But you can basically change the value of X and Y, and we'll do an example of this in code. Um, Non-equality, that threw me for quite a while. The, the tilde equals uh, still gets me when I bump around. Um, I'm, I do a lot of JavaScript and C, C sharp and... Uh, a little bit of Python outside of this, but that one still gets me a lot. Uh, one base indexing, um, it's one of them we gripe about as developers and, and moan, but I got over it pretty fast. It's, it's not that bad, but yeah, it's an easy slam, right? Really, one base index, but um, <laughs> uh, that's the case. Uh, there's no classes in Lua, um, but we definitely can do object-oriented development and we're gonna implement that with tables and functions. And that's probably a little more on the advanced side. Uh, we'll touch on it a little bit. I got an example to show uh, a piece of that, but the, the OO that you'd be thinking of from uh, some of the other languages would probably be uh, um, you know, beyond where we'll get to tonight, but you can pull that off through the use of uh, prototyping and uh, uh, meta tables. And so essentially what it works is, like I said, everything's a table, you, inc you end up inc you end up implementing a base table, so to speak, and then you assign uh, its meta table, it's called that actually, of your, your new table uh, to that. And then anytime you want to call a property or a function of that table, it'll, it'll look in itself first. If it has it, great. If not, it'll call the, the one from above. So it's, it's kind of like prototyping uh, from some of the other languages. And let's see. And then, yeah, that's, that's how you achieve uh, your inheritance is exactly that with meta tables. All right, so we're going to burn through these data types, and then we'll crack the code open. But um, the nil type uh, is simply that. Contains nil. It's like you know before. Um, the global variables in Lua, this is your way of also um, setting them for removal and queuing them up for uh, garbage collection. So when you... Uh, when you first declare a global variable, uh, but you haven't assigned it yet, it'll contain the value nil. Once you've assigned a variable to it, and then you assign it to nil, it'll stage it for garbage collection. Uh, Booleans are false and true. A uh, couple nuances with Lua. Uh, zero and empty string are considered true in Lua. That's different than uh, a lot of stuff. So that can mess you up a couple times. <laughs> Uh, when you run into that. Um, so the only thing considered false is false and nil. Those will evaluate to false. Same as Ruby. Is that the same as Ruby? Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, zero and That's empty okay. string. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, it must be. <laughs> it's not. It's just my slide deck. Yeah, it's not. They would, they would just be lower. 
Let's see, the number type. Uh, basically, they're all real numbers in Lua. There's no integer. You can pull down the source code and you can compile it uh, to your own int, but they all are, uh, what is it, double position uh, floating point values. And so you can hold a solid integer value up to, oh, I think it's two to the 54th power or something, but basically think of a 64-bit integer um, it will work perfectly. If you get above that, then you can start getting into the, the hardcore engineer rounding issues and whatnot, uh, and you may need to do your own uh, build of Lua to support something greater than that. But this, this double precision floating point value will handle what we would call integer in a lot of other language just fine up to that size. So uh, keeps it simple. All right, strings, uh, just what you'd expect. Uh, they're immutable. Uh, you're going to delimit these with single or double quotes. So I think that's that's the same as JavaScript, yeah? You can go single or double, right? Uh, so yeah, that next line, uh, you know, A equals same and B equals single tick same. Is that same. Code right there? This right here? Yes. Yes, it is. That line. No, it's probably, it's probably written bad. I just want to show you that setting A with this double quotes and B with single quotes yields you the same thing. So. Oh, well, I just meant as well as that. Yeah, so I think that works all the way across, but yeah. Yeah, you can do assignments instead of comparisons. Uh, you can also use uh, escape sequences. So you can do, you know, for like new line and line breaks and that kind of thing. So you can put the uh, backslash letter and uh, you can get a whole list of those out there. Um, here's a fun one, concatenation. Uh, anybody do this before anywhere? Uh, so you do the dot dot. The only catch with the only catch with this for concatenation in Lua is if uh, if we're not using variables here, and instead I'm using a number. So if I want to append something to a number, you need to leave a space here after the, uh, your number space dot dot what you're concatenating because otherwise they'll think it's a decimal. So that's the only catch with that. But that's how you concatenate is you do dot dot. Okay, so uh, like we said, for function, they are first class. Uh, this means they can be stored in variables. They can be passed as arguments to other functions. Uh, they can even be returned as results. And they can return multiple values. So uh, that is a very cool feature, and we'll, we'll demo that here in just a short time. Let's see, go back here. Um, am I on tables yet? No, this isn't caught up. Okay, so user data and threads. Uh, we won't touch on a lot of these tonight. These are um, kind of more on the advanced end, but uh, user data allows you to put um, C data stored in a, in a Lua variable, and that's more important if you're actually doing that that glue layer with your own engine and you're embedding Lua for someone else to use as opposed to, it's kind of the two different avenues, right? You're gonna make an engine and make it easy for someone to use, so you're gonna make this glue layer and, and put Lua in front of it and let people talk to your APIs through that. Um, or you're gonna use someone who's already gone through that pain and, and you're, lose, you're using Lua to call their APIs. Um, and so you may need uh, to take advantage of that C data um, and how it talks to your underlying uh, code base. And then threads and Lua are handled with uh, coroutines. Um, I, I don't know if we'll, I don't know if I have one of those going for you tonight or not. I'd have to see at the end of my deal, but um, uh, you can do it. So it's not uh, true multi-threading, but you can uh, pull it off. Okay, the table. This is the this is the key guy. Um, this is one of the most exciting parts of Lua, really. Um, so they're implemented as associative arrays. Uh, they get indexed with numbers, strings, or any value but nil, and that's important. So when we say any value, it's uh, these eight data types we just mentioned, right? So uh, we can stick a function uh, as a key of one of these tables, uh, and we're going to demonstrate that and show it, and it's pretty cool. Threads. What's that? Threads, too. Um, 
That's a good question. We'll have to look. You could probably stick the, the coroutine, the, the implementation of threading, you could probably put the coroutines that get called into those keys. But I haven't done that. That'd be a good one to try, John. Why not? I bet you could. Uh, okay, so here we'll show a couple things on the screen before we break open the laptop. Um, so Lua objects are tables. So we're kind of running down the, from the top here. Uh, here we've got a table. And the way we uh, instantiate these is a, there's a handful of ways to do it, but the way we're showing here, uh, we're just using those curly braces. And then they're all dynamically created, of course. That's the point. And we put uh, any number of uh, elements in there. And so this first one, uh, since we're not uh, pointing out what we want our keys to be, that first one's basically an associative array. So those are all going to get indexed. Uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, the other table, uh, that one is a little bit different. We're actually saying uh, we want x, which is going to be, think of that as a property of this table, uh, to be 5, y to be 7, uh, and a name property to equal Joe. Um, if you wanted just an empty table to work with later in your code, you're just going to say new table equals the two squiggly braces, and you've got a new table to work with. Um, this version here, we're just setting the first element to the letter A. And then down here, uh, we're saying, I like to think of that as a property. Um, it's actually just the key of that table. So we're setting the key x equal to 5. Um, this right here, I don't have the example there, but that line there where we're doing the new table dot x equal 5, that's the same as if we want it. That's kind of the shortcut if we were to type uh, new table dot bracket double quote x. So Lua will just interpret that for you and, and handle that shortcut uh, notation. Uh, that, that's built in of part of the table libraries, the has properties, and there's a whole slew of uh, things we can check, you know, for the size and of tables and how many elements and arrays and iterating through them, um, and we have some of that to show. Um, but anyway, that's just give you the first look of uh, Lua objects as tables, and it'll be more practical when we crack open code, but um, there's just a quick cover uh, that's, you know, it's not that scary or different. Uh, you got JavaScript here on the left and some chunk of Lua over on the right. And uh, probably the first thing you'll notice is we don't get a lot of the shortcuts that some of the other languages, you know, have nowadays. So it's kind of a verbose scripting language. So you're going to have to put in, uh, you know, x equals x plus 1. You're not going to get x plus equal 1, you know, those kind of shortcuts. You're, you're not going to get uh, switch or case statements. You're going to live in uh, the land of else if, else if, else if. Um, so it's, it's, it's verbose in that sense. Um, but it hasn't been enough to, uh, um, I guess, detract from the efficiencies you gain and the power of the language. I haven't found it uh, to be something I've griped enough that I wouldn't use it for. Okay, so this part dips into a little, uh, little bit of uh, Corona, but it's only a handful of slides and we'll run through here and then I'm gonna crack open the laptop and show you guys some other examples. But uh, this is Lua we're writing here. And so in this case, uh, we're declaring Sky as, uh, and again, this part, that part's Lua, but it's just for the sake of this presentation, it'll kind of show you. Um, in Corona, that one line would yield you um, a background on your device and that would work on Android iPhone, iPad, whatever. Um, Want to go in and add a little more to this. So now we'll add a ground. Um, and again, this next line, we're using uh, some Corona APIs, but that's the whole point of Lua. Let, let the underlying uh, C code of Corona go do the heavy lifting of dealing with this graphics and putting that there. I just have to tell it, hey, I want to use this image, and I want you to place it at uh, X and Y coordinates here on the screen, and then that's going to yield me. Um, now we have this nice, beautiful grass sky. And then we continue on with this code and now we're going to add a little crate and we're going to set that to again a, a little hunk of Corona code saying hey we're going to put a new image on the screen and it's called crate.png so could you put it at this x and y coordinate and turn it by 10 degrees for us. So now we've got it propped up there and it's angled down just a little bit. So if we add a little more code to this, uh, we're going to turn on some physics. And again, this is a little more Corona-based, but just to give you an idea of 
the combination of the two and why Lua is so fast, um, they've handled the heavy lifting for us of things like physics, and we can just write things like, what's that? Huh? Oh, nice, good one. And then we're gonna just tell it, hey, we're gonna require the physics library in with that top line, and then we're gonna just tell it, start it up. And so now we've got physics enabled. And then we're just gonna come down here and we're gonna use that same physics library and we're gonna tell it, um, add a body around that ground that we created and uh, give it some friction and static type just tells it uh, stay there so it doesn't fall off the screen. And then finally, we're gonna come down here to our crate and give it some physics properties. Um, so as Steve would say, we'll make it heavy so it falls. And uh, that yields us. Now we have a crate falling, hitting the ground that we put some physics around and it dropped off. And so I think we're somewhere at like 20 lines of code or something like now. So if we want lots of crates, uh, and again, now we're just pure Lua again. We've, the Corona stuff is already happening. We're just saying, hey, we're gonna take this. Let's turn this into a function. So we all know functions in here, I'm sure. Uh, we'll create a local function. We're gonna call it spawn crate. We're gonna stick that same physics code inside of it. Um, all the functions end with end. Uh, and then we're gonna call this little timer library for us and say, hey, every half a second, spawn a crate and uh, do it 50 times essentially. And uh, we kick that off and then they just keep spewing out and dropping and hitting each other and reacting with the physics. Um, Again, the power of Lua, we didn't have to code any of that. A trip over this wire. So, you know, these are just a couple slides showing you, like, okay, we want it to go up instead of down. We put in a negative gravity setting and whoosh, away they go. Is, is Lua so. basically the only way you, you write apps with Corona SDK, or you, can you have your choice of life? With Corona, you're, you are limited. It's only Lua. That's all they support for theirs. So they're not, uh, they're not like Unity where you can choose you know, C Sharp or JavaScript. So depending on the gaming engine, it would vary. Um, but yeah, Corona is only, and uh, we're going to jump over to the laptop now. Corona is only Lua. Um, what kind of phone? iPhone. iPhone, yeah, you could actually do it just on the developer side and push it right to her phone. Um, you still need the developer account on the Apple side. If you, if you were Android, you could actually build the APK and stick that on there with nothing. But Apple, you still need the developer account. For Apple, the developer account is about 100 bucks. Yep, per year. So, so 300 bucks to... Actually, actually, you could be 200 because if you only cared about iOS uh, through Corona, you can either do Android for 99, Apple for 99, or you can do both for 349. So if you just wanted Apple, you could do 100 bucks. Um, yeah, and if you, if you didn't care about a splash screen, you can use Corona absolutely free. So the, the only way you would need to pay Corona is if you wanted to deploy to the App Store. You could develop fully in it and have a splash screen, deploy it locally, and never pay, never pay a penny. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yep. Okay, let's see what we can do here. We're doing good on time. I'm going to throw this. I hope you can see this. Okay, not great yet. I got an odd lug. Did I spell that right? Odd lug? O D lug somewhere in here. <laughs> Dev. I was waiting for that Google group to free up. Yeah. <laughs> One. Open with Sublime. Um, I do all my code editing for Lua in Sublime. Uh, I don't know. Anybody else in here use Sublime? All? No? Some some Steve? So we can, Ugh, that's horrible. Let's see if we can make this bigger. Yeah, I have all these blocks out right now. As long as we can see, can you see that top line where it just says print odd lug up there? 
long as you can see that, we'll be good because they'll start lighting these sections up and we'll just walk through them. So anyway, uh, this is pure Lua. This has nothing to do with uh, Corona. Everything you're going to see in this file is all Lua. So you could take this, and if you want it, I can publish this. I'll send it to Jay, or we'll put it out somewhere afterwards, whatever. Put it on you have to add it to our GitHub. Dropbox. Yeah, we'll add it out to GitHub if you were interested. But uh, everything you took here, you could grab any Lua interpreter, and it'll, it'll run. So uh, this isn't anything to do with Corona at this point. We're just running. Uh, I'm just making use of Corona's interpreter for the sake of this because it's all set up here. So. Awesome. Okay, so the most e the easiest line of code ever, right? Print uh, hello odd log. So hit that in. Uh, so this is the part I was going to show you guys with the comments. Uh, if you remember, we talked about we do the double dash, and double box, and then you end it the same way, right? Um, so um, one thing you can do that's kind of cool, and I don't know if you guys know any tricks in another language, but uh, you can just add one here and open up like a block at a time. Um, it's really handy when you're building up a library or not. So let's go down here. Obviously, that's nothing cool, but uh, let's go through a basic uh, if then else uh, in Lua. So I can just light this up with one dash. So when you're debugging or adding a new function or whatever, it's just kind of slick that you can cheat out a whole block like that. So I don't know. I guess I like the little things. <laughs> um, so let's go through this a little bit. So this is uh, if then else, you know, very common, uh, something that, um, you know, you're going to need to do in every language. Um, but what we've got is a variable uh, op, and in this case it's global because uh, we haven't tagged it with local. So same as JavaScript, if we don't, if we don't go out of our way, it's going to be a global variable. So we need to do that uh, to do some good coding practices, but for this it'll be fine. Uh, so we're just going to set it to that star, and then we'll run this, and then you can see it should drop through. Um, I don't know, any questions around this? Probably everyone is pretty comfortable with this, and it's going to drop through. We're going to hit that uh, print line, so let's just run this. And I'll come back here. And, uh, this is where it's going to get us, though. So you'll, you'll have to trust me. I'll read it. I can't make this window bigger on this monitor. Um, I just printed out that line. We hit the else if that we'd expect based on the variable, and it says uh, just some. I put some little notes in here along the way, more about Lua. But um, the standard Lua libraries are in there for uh, mathematical, table, string, I/O, OS, and debug. That's kind of like the core ones, and then there's millions out there created for everything from uh, JSON, uh, networking, email. Are those typically written in C then? actual libraries or are they written in Lua? They are these are actually down in the C level, these standard ones. So you're gonna get like a you know string G sub to parse out a section or whatever and they're handling that. It's a little like stuff on C pan with, with Perl where it's like hooked into it, right? Exactly. Let's see, so after that one, I'm gonna turn this one off. We're gonna come down here. So light this one up. So this section here, uh, we're just going to look at a little bit um, and talk through this automatic uh, string conversions. And so uh, that's what Lua will handle for you. Uh, so you see in that first line, and I, this will work out good because you can't see when I run it good, but I actually put the outcomes over there, and I can run it to prove it if you want to call my bluff. But the first line there, we're going to take the string 10 and uh, add 1 to it, and uh, Lua will magically turn that into a number and say, great, what you wanted was 11. Uh, the next one, uh, you can see in that case, uh, nope, we're going to get that string literal. Uh, 10 plus 1 will be your output. Uh, over here with some going scientific on you, it'll still convert that just fine as a number and do the math. And then uh, in the last one, however, um, you get down there and you see the catch, right? So we're, that one's going to generate an error because it couldn't turn that into a number when we tried to add one to it. So Pearl tells me the correct answer is one. Oh, <laughs> nice. So it's using the right hand side to determine the type. Yeah. Yep. So, okay, so well, that, that's, I guess that's not true. It's actually evaluating. It's evaluating them each one at a time. 
And the way it actually works is it's going to take all of the, um, it's going to evaluate all the values first and then do any assignments or uh, mathematical operations. And so it's going to look at hello and say, this is a string. And it's just going to bomb because it can't add the numeric it's one. It's a string, right? That one it's able to convert. Right. So would it evaluate both? You get a string and a number and then it decides later through a tree? Yeah, I don't know in this order. Because if we run it, let's try it. Which is how does that go? So every everything has either a two string or a two. It's not a value up. Yeah, something. And they automatically are in both when needed. Yeah. So on both of on both of those, it will invoke two string and value of or I don't know if it's value of, but whatever to determine if it's a number. If it has that, that takes precedence. Uh, and the other, assuming the other one can match that, otherwise it falls back to the string. So I can verify that, but I bet you're right on that. I, it escapes me right now. But did you guys want me to mess with this and try flipping these, or did somebody say try one? Same error. No matter which way they go. Okay. Cool. So here's the next one. Uh, kind of highlights that. So um, you know, this is just converting a number to a string. So just showing you some of those string libraries. You can do two string to explicitly tell it, hey, use this as a string, and then we evaluate. Uh, is it the string ten? Yes. Um, and then here's a really crazy way. I wouldn't ever do this, just a sample I grabbed. Um, <laughs> but you could uh, apparently append an empty string on it and I'll force it to a string also. So they have to be the same type for equal store? Yeah. Okay. They have to evaluate to the same value. So would, would 10 equals the 10 string be true without I mean, if we take this part off, I guess yeah. which line are you talking? Yeah. This one here, 43? Yeah. Now, the num yeah, numeric 10 to string 10, it would bomb. Okay. We, can, we can run that to prove it. Just take this out. Take that. See, still false. Denied. And we'll just put that back. All right, so now we start getting some of the interesting things of this language. Go back here. Take uh, go. Now this is size so huge, I gotta just read my note here. Let's chop this down. the other day. I don't remember what I said. Okay, so yeah. Uh, multiple assignment of a function call uh, as the last or only expression produces as many results as needed that match the variables. So we can do some interesting things here. Um, so if we've got these three functions, uh, we've got foo, zero, one, two. Uh, the first one Obviously, it's just nil. Uh, foo1 just returns one value, but foo2 returns uh, a and b. And so this is just showing you uh, we can call that, um, and we'll just have this last line up for now. But if we call x comma y comma z equals uh, 10 comma foo2, the output we're going to get is x will end up equaling 10, y will be a, uh, z will be b. If we leave z off of that, it'll just drop off. It'll, it won't do anything with it. Um, and like it says, it'll just evaluate to uh, however many it needs to match the variables. So even if we passed in five more variables, all the extras will just come back with null. It won't error or crash or anything. So if you wanted to call uh, foo2, uh, you know, set it, you could do x, a, b, c, d, e, f, g, x, y, comma, x, y, z equals foo2, and just all oh, those first three will get uh, the, uh, or the first two will get A and B, and then everything else will be nil. 
Good, bad, ugly? Yes. Similar to anything? <laughs> yes, <laughs> all the above. What's it similar to? Some of you guys using this pearl? Python, Ruby, okay. Ruby. Yeah, I haven't done any pearl, but I've done some Python. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the tuple, right, the tuple pattern there. So you can actually extract it out as a multiple variables. So. That would be like the deconstruction stuff. Right, like deconstruction, like closure. And, and that's what I think behind the scenes here is going on, but Lou is just like, hey, I'll handle all that. You, you give me whatever, I'm going to, I'll I'll give you back however many you need, and I'll fill the extras with nil. And so we can further show that by uh, this example here. This section up. Oh, sorry, I gotta, I gotta break these out because with the screen size to be able to read it. So in multiple assignment, uh, Lua first evaluates all values and then only executes the assignments. So this is where I was getting confused on your question uh, earlier, um, but same kind of deal. We can swap these values, um, and what that's saying is that great. We were gonna say x and y equals three and three and four. Uh, if we do x comma y equals y comma x, uh, you don't end up with you know two of the same. It's just gonna it's gonna look at the left side and go, what are these values three and four, and it's gonna swap them. Okay, is that slide seventy three there? Is that a pearl thing as well? Maybe you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Should have known that. You need a lot more dollar signs though. Yeah. What's that? You need more dollar signs and semicolons. Oh, dollar signs and semicolons. Then you got it. Okay. Cool, so now uh, we're gonna get down here, we'll do a couple of uh, basic uh, um, examples of uh, tables. It's like I said, one of my favorite parts, and I think it's a good topic for kind of the intro to Lua. Um, so here's just some various assignments. Um, probably the next section is the more focused way to look at it, but if you look at this line here, I mean, we're just creating a table, um, you know, nothing to it. Um, that line isn't really there, but. You know, this is just setting the variable k to x as we build onto this. So now uh, we're setting a new entry with the key of the x from the line above and a value of 10, right? So if you follow along here, uh, now we're doing a new entry with a key of 20 and a value that equals great. And so if we wanted to print uh, ax, uh, you all get this answer, 10, right? because we set that key right here from this line above. So obviously a very nasty way to do it, but just showing you uh, uh, the power of how you can set these uh, keys and values in these tables. And this next section will uh, better show that. Well, let's just jump down there because this is just more of the same. We're manipulating a variable that didn't change as the key and then we're set the value on that. But let's just jump down here um, this one, uh, I took a lot of this, a uh, buddy of mine, John, John Beebe, um, he's got a great blog. Um, I did a lot of stuff with him uh, with Corona and stuff. He's since, he actually worked for Corona, now he works for another, uh, another company and I still do stuff with him. But he did a great blog uh, one day on just tables and uh, I admittedly took these samples from his blog. Uh, so if you look up uh, John Beebe and... Um, Again, it's up in this file up here, um, understanding Lua tables, but he just did a great job of simplifying it and uh, something I looked at a long time ago and I have it in my, in my Lua favorites and I uh, thought it'd be appropriate, so I'm gonna share it here. But uh, here we're gonna just have this color table, right? And so we're gonna go through here. Um, so three different ways to do the same thing. Um, and these are just creating like a straight up array in Lua. So here we're explicitly saying, hey, we're going to set the index, um, go through here, set these values, these colors, and then we print, and then the output, and we're going to get yellow, you know, pretty cut and dry. 
The next way that you can do it in Lua is when you instantiate the table. So you can see the difference here, and I'll try. Sorry, it's so dark, but up here we just instantiated the table, and then we put all the elements in, you know, one by one afterwards. Um, up here we did it like on an instantiation, so within the curly braces, we just comma delimit and do the exact same thing. Is it illegal to have a, an extra comma like after purple? It absolutely is. In fact, I got a note right down here on item three. So, um, can you do that in other places? Is that why you asked that? See, I love that. I wish that was in every language. Because how many times are you cut and pasted in those stuff? Right. What's that? And the extra family comma is okay in JavaScript and in Ruby, isn't it? Newer JavaScript. Yeah. I noticed it. Yeah, not in IE. No, that's that's why I made a point to note it down here. It's one of my favorite little deals is that I can leave that trailing comma. Awesome. I love it. Okay, so yeah, that's just method two. Like right when you instantiate it, you can just comma delimit them and, and plunk in your uh, values there. And then this uh, third way, um, you know, this would be basically letting it auto index. And so you don't have to say index one is this, index two is this, index three is this. You just list them out and you're basically making an associative array um, this way. There, yeah, the, in the base index is one. So, size would be five? Yes. Okay. And you can cheat and explicitly make your own zero index and work, but you're, you're in for a headache <laughs> if you do it. <laughs> I've done it. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, to your point, and so if we were this example above, let me light this back up. If that was active and this was active, uh, you get the count like what Jay just asked um, with this pound sign. So that's, that's how you know how many uh, elements are in that. Um, there's a catch with that. Um, it will tell you how many, the size of the table. Um, if you want to iterate through it, whatever, um, I'll show you. We're getting close, uh, a couple more sections down. But to iterate this, there's some built-in um, Iterators they provide for you for doing the, the key value pairs and one is good if you're doing with an associative array and everything fits in there nicely. But you see how powerful this is. So if you have index one, two, three, giraffe, and then seven, eight, nine, it won't go in order and that giraffe would be left out of that example. And so there's a way to do that with calling one of these uh, pairs, uh, key value pairs methods and it'll make sure it catches everything in your table. So let's go down here. How about uniqueness of the keys? Yes, they have to be. Okay. Yep. No, no keys? What's that? Oh, no. Yeah, no, no nil. Any other value for a key, and you're good. Sensitive? Yes. Okay. Sorry for the color. Throw this back on here. Um, so yeah, if you've worked with you know dictionary, it's just kind of driving that home. And here's the uh, the comma. I'm glad other people like that besides me. I just thought that was the silliest thing, but I love being able to leave that there. Um, and so yeah, we can access this. Um, you can see now our keys are these properties. And so really, what's happening here is Lua's Lua is uh, giving us a nice shortcut way to to set these up. That's really no different than if we were to come in here and. Uh, oh, sorry. I mean, bracket. I put this on here, and then this here, and that there. Oh, and that there. So that that is the same. So obviously a lot more. If you can get some, uh, if you can get verbose uh, cheats, uh, you should take them because there's a lot of code that we don't get um, to make use of. So um, yeah. So to access those, um, you know, you can start thinking of it as an object and as a property in a lot of cases. So. Um, Throw that one out. Ah, oh, the size is really.
cause him any grief. We'll make do. Okay, so now something a little more practical. Um, you know, tables can hold any kinds of data within its individual keys. That means you can store additional tables, functions, uh, function references, uh, as well as indexes and numbers. And so, you know, here's something a little more practical. We can have these people uh, objects, and then we want a Bob and a Jane, and maybe set their age, their gender, and then we can dig that out by calling, uh, you know, people. If we go to the first index, we're dealing with Bob. You see that, we're going to get the answer Bob. And if we go to index two, um, and call the gender property, um, we get female. And so uh, two different ways to access you know, that same information. And so you can, you, know, you can do, the lexicon's pretty flexible there. You can do that route or you can do the, the dot notation and call that. So I like to think of the tables as just like endless file cabinets, right? So it's you got this drawer, and then inside that, there's break that in half, and then half, and you can stick another drawer in it, or another whole cabinet, or another room, or whatever you want into it. So uh, it's pretty slick. Let's see. I just have a few more examples in here, and then I'll give you guys uh, one more quick full app peak demo, and then we'll see what else you want to know. Um, I was saying local function. Scope it to the function. Yeah, so in this case, it's at the module level, but that could easily be within a function. You can declare a variable scope just to that function. So okay. otherwise, it would be global. Exactly. Yeah, if you didn't have that in front of it, um, it's global. And so here we got an example, and we're going to make it a little more wild. So we've got this local function of hello world. And now we're going to have our table that we've been working with for a while. And we're going to have a key of Bob. And then we're going to have a key that's a reference to hello world. And so we can actually call uh, my table dot func. And it will execute that function. That's way cool. So any questions on that or comments or craziness? What's that? Can you hurry? I didn't hear it. Can you hurry that function? Uh, that I do not know. I just don't want to set that function. Do a function of function I know you can do like maybe what's similar in Lua if, if we're talking the same thing like if that function wanted to call another one you can put a tail call is what they call it in Lua so you could actually this function could return the call of another function and chain so them up that way yeah Right. Yeah, you could do that, and then you would send that in right here. If, what, if you've got a local function and pass that into another function, I guess you're still within that. Still be there. Yeah, that starts getting a, a little farther, but there's, uh, I'm trying to think of the right, I'll get the name wrong, I know it right now, but. Um, when you start referencing you know, the scope variables of, of what called it, um, it, Lua handles that. I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but closures, closures yeah. So it has the closures um, way of referencing the variable from the outer scope inside, and so it, it supports that. Um, what's, what's the syntax for? If I wanted to, in the hello world, if I wanted to uh, take the, uh, at, the attribute uh, of name so I could print hello Bob instead of hello world or, or print hello Carl or hello uh, Don, uh, is it self or this or what's the way to reference the, the same table? Right, you would do, you would do uh, self, um, yeah, it's just, it's all underscore self. 
um, dot, and then there's a trick to that, and you'll, you'll want to look this up more in depth than I'm ready to explain here, but the way you declare the function uh, kind of dictates what you need to pass into it, and so if you use a semicolon to declare your function, uh, Lua kind of knows, hey, I'll bake self into here, um, and so you have access to self within that function. If you do the dot notation, you need to pass uh, in your call, you would need to send your self variable in with that object to be referenced, okay. if that makes sense. Um, so here we would end up sending my table in with this, um, in this example. So let's see if we could do, let me see if I can get this right, right here. But if this were instead uh, self.name. Yeah. Um, I didn't turn off some stuff somewhere. Maybe. Let's make. Let me see what this one is. Self. And that's not in there, so I think we would have to do. I think in this case I would have to pass it in. Um, let me see if this works because I didn't declare it able to do that. Uh, me, me, uh, sorry, you could call my table. So then that gets a bob. So yeah, oh, okay. um, so in this, in this example, I didn't, I didn't declare the function that uses the, the shortcut to pass self in. But um, I have to remember that. What you would do is you would do function, and then I'm going off my cuff here, but you would do um, uh, function. Um, it would look, this isn't going to work right here, but I would just show you this line. It would be like my table, hello world, oh. with no parameter. And then when we call it, then we have access to self. Single colon, colon, double colon. Yes. So that's how that would work um, to get at the object itself. So there's a couple ways to handle it. Um, and that's good. That's a, that's a good hour long read in that because it's, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty flexible. And, and if you declare it one way, you, know, you can call it either way. Um, but if you only declare it the way we have, then you, you're forced to pass in the object. And so it's worth digging into that um, when you got time to go farther. Throw this out. Um, I think this is one more variation that I had set up. But in this one, uh, this is doing it just basically all in line. Like we're not, we can just declare the function right here and do something, you know, magical uh, right in line of our table declaration or instantiation. Yeah, we set the, uh, we set all our properties right here. We create the anonymous function. It's ready to be called. And you're, uh, so that's handy if you're calling out to something else, obviously, from there, but it's really slick. Yeah, so, oh, the insanity. Uh, this is what I was showing, uh, talking about earlier. Um, this is how you can tell your, uh, you know, indexes that you have in, in your loop, or in your table, sorry, so that you can uh, run your for loop and iterate, iterate over that table. So you just put the pound sign in front of it. Uh, that's going to catch them all. Uh, so we're just going to go, you know, one, so we're one based to uh, the total count of L or indexes in your table. And it's important to remember it like that way because, uh, yeah, if you get, you know, crazy with your tables um, and you have some of those functions going on or other elements, um, that's not going to do it for you. you, so you, you can get right over that. Exactly. You'll, function, it would just it skip right by. It won't catch you. Yeah, it is. It is. You just have to know in the context of what you're doing exactly right. It's very handy on one hand, and on another hand, it's like ah. 
it all depends on how you're using that table and what, what its purpose is. Um, and then by the same thing, if you do need to go through everything in that um, and evaluate each key, um, this is how you do it. You just do, you know, a key value variable in this uh, pairs, and it's one of, from that table library that we talked about and sort of the core libraries that come with Lua. It's just some built-in functions, and, and you can look at all these. Just go look at, you know, table out on the Lua org site, and you'll get all the functions you can do. Is there a is function function in the library somewhere that says this this object is a function? So you can check. Um, so you're going to key value pair, you're going to, you're going to, if you got a function that's in that table. Yeah, I think you can. I think you can tell. I think you can tell that there's some there's some object um, um, library functions you can call that will return the types of what it is. So you'll you'll know if this is a table. Or a function or a number. So, yeah, you can evaluate for that if you were wanting to search through and just call all the functions, for example, or something like that. You can do that. So, okay, that's the last of uh, my samples that I had um, for, I don't know, an intro to Lua. Um, I guess we could kick it open for some other roundabout questions. And if you guys wanted to see a little more, I've got like countless projects I could open, or we could kick it over somebody else to show something. So yeah, go ahead. Okay, and that iterator over that table, where it was uh, the previous one. The previous one? Yeah. Go back over here. Uh, you have a, you had a function in there, didn't you? Somewhere in that, or, okay, so you have that, and you have a function in a table. What happens when you do that print? It would just skip right by it. Okay. Nothing, nothing would happen. It would just blow right by it, because it actually wouldn't even register that it's in there. Okay, because this is the way you declared in my table there, you've, you've assured that it's going to be assigned to the digits, so we're starting with one. Right. So blue one's going to be blue, two's going to be red. So the other thing, what I've seen happen though, is that when you hit that gap, like let's say you had one index, one, two, five, six, seven, giraffe, 10, 11, 12, you're done at seven. Oh, it's not going to skip over and go, it's, it's just going to, yeah. Makes sense. So the number in the table is the number this will give you the number of elements if you don't have a broken associative array table. So I guess that's the catch. If you break your associative array by putting in functions and other things, um, you're better off going through the uh, pairs and evaluating for what you need or skipping over. So. Does it have a, is there a push? For queues, yeah, you can you can do queues really good with tables in Lua. So I don't have an example ready for you, but it'll handle stacks and queues like really, yeah, elegantly. So. So if you have some a, a table that has a bunch of different types in it, and you want to know how many of everything is in there, would the pound tell you that? It would. It would. It would. Okay. You know it has 15 things. So it's only when it's doing the for loop that it breaks out at, at the point where it can't find, where it's not a yeah. number. That's my understanding of it. I haven't had a lot of mixed or broken ones. I've tended to separate my associative arrays from my yeah. other stuff going on, but it's uh, definitely powerful enough to do that. Maybe this isn't so much a Lua question, but a Corona question, but um, how do you usually do local storage? like? If you're right, if you're right, let's say Corona app, and um, you're obviously not going to use MySQL on your handheld, what do you, what do you typically do to just, are there any NoSQL databases that are good for the? Yeah, so SQL. And you have to install those separately, or they come with Corona, or? No, you can get um, SQLite is nati natively supported on all the devices, so SQLite's great. Um, you can use um, a really nice manager called Lita. Um, it's kind of like a very, slim down uh, SQL Server Management Studio to manage your SQLite database. Okay. And Lita, L-I-T-A, it's one I use. I don't know, there's, there's probably a bunch out there, but it's called Lita, and it'll, it's basically a little management studio for SQLite, so you can you know, add tables and indexes and um, all your uh, normal, you know, set up all your uh, uh, object models and that in the, in the database. And then there's actually Lua libraries. Like, I want to use SQLite. There's already, you can just go get them, you know. 
and have uh, access in and out of your data set. <coughs> How's the support for uh, uh, XML processing? And it's outstanding. I mean, I've, I've pretty much, um, in my Corona stuff that I'm doing, I'm pretty much doing everything JSON. Um, but XML processing, all that is outstanding in Lua. Does this, can we work with JSON, does it convert it into native, like a Lua table of table of tables? Exactly, there's, there's a Lua library that's really great and you basically just say, you know, encode or decode and it will take a Lua table and turn it into JSON and back. And then you can persist that even on the device. And so uh, you can go a long way just using IO and JSON files and swap them in and out of Lua tables and it's just seamless. So, um, I'll give you one last quick one and then were you gonna, did you wanna do something else if you guys had any or are we, are we baked? You guys want me to throw something else on the screen? Or are you done? I'm, I'm open, so. <laughs> So we're baked. What, um, well, online it said 9 to 11. 9 to 11? Well, it said 7 to 9, but if you added it to your Google calendar, it put it down as 9 to 11. <laughs> it could have been a time zone. That might be a, yeah, that might be a, that might be a stretch. Where did you get, where did you click? Because I don't have a link to add the calendar. Um, I was on the Corona site. On the Corona site, it has uh, the meeting, this meeting on it. And it says add the calendar, so I clicked it and added it to my calendar. calendar is I don't know, they always have their same stuff messed up. Well, I'll show you this real, real quick. If you guys have another question that comes to mind while we kind of well, drift through this. Corona, again, yeah. is like, um, how do you handle like object collisions? And obviously, like, when those boxes are falling on the screen, can you set up your own rules for, like, say, um, something gets close enough and it causes it? I should ask you guys this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any yeah, any of the fri friction, particle systems, all that. I mean, Corona really, they're not doing anything fancy. They're wrapping uh, Box2D, and so you're getting an API to that. And so if you've looked at Box2D open source physics model, that's what Corona is wrapping. So does that mean I can put a, something down there on the screen like a box or a spaceship, and then I can get some physics rules and kick it off, and then, you know, let it fall back Oh, absolutely, all yeah. Good stuff? And then when it hits we, the ground, we can make Angry Birds in about two hours. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there you go. Um, and you basically manage those things with Lua. To, and you set up all those objects and treat them as objects in Lua and then right. and, and change their physics or whatever you need. Yeah, and I can show you a demo of that too. Um, I'll just show you guys a quick one. This was. This was a little game of uh, Conway's Game of Life and through a couple of game jams and different events, it's just something that I've been working on. So this was the raw form and I'll show you what I converted it into. Um, the actual, um, where you see this function of processing this 2D array and then this one you'll see where it's spawning these cells, um, uh, these shapes. Uh, this was a library that was already floating around. I mean, everybody, it's, it's published out there. Um, I should credit this guy. It's uh, up here, references uh, by this Dave Bollinger. Uh, but he basically had this Lua code to, you know, implement Conway's Game of Life. I don't know if you're all familiar with it, but the cellular automata stuff, everybody's done it sometime in their life probably. Um, but anyway, he had this library out there. And so it, it ran, and that's all great, but it was just purely Lua. You know, the interpreter runs, and you get the data. Um, but I took it and then just wrapped it up into Corona so that you could at least bring some visuals to it and whatnot. And so um, with what you guys have seen here, I won't dig into the actual life functions. Uh, we won't dig through those right now. But what I will show you, now you're familiar enough with tables. Uh, here's these cool shapes um, from Conway's Game of Life. Um, and so we can create them in these uh, Lua tables. And if you're familiar with it, you can create these things of you know gliders and butterflies, and they all interact with each other and live and breathe and die and whatever. But anyways, uh, take that, and then we put a few uh, graphic elements on it and put it into something like Corona, and we can kick this cellular stuff off. 
and let it run and watch. And so you see the cells are spawning, and then they look at the one next to it and see if it's alive or dead, and if it should spawn or die, and it goes through that and let it run. But then you start getting a graphical uh, representation to it. And so that was kind of the first round and uh, just playing around with life and Corona that I did. Uh, but then on the last game jam, uh, I really didn't have a lot of inspiration for something to work on, but what I was working on was a new um, screen management library for Corona. And so I took that game of life and we advanced to this round. So you see a lot more files, a lot more project files. Most of them are icons, but you can see all your Lua files down here. Sorry, close the window that I'm looking for. And so this evolved into actually making, um, you know, a, a fun little game out of it. And so, um, you know, here's the rules. And so what this was more about was me making this screen manager and the transitions that you see happening as opposed to the life code, which you just saw running in its raw form. Um, but really it was about making these screen transitions happen or whatever. And so then I made this little screen and so that you could come in here and um, you know guess a pattern. And I don't know what it'll do, but hit simulate. And then it would go in here and execute it and say, oh, it, apparently it only went one generation and had six life forms and we're just done because it's stabilized. So if we come in and maybe try um, I don't know what's a good pattern. I forget all these. You can look them up. Hey, we got four oscillators that we generated out of that. Cool. Um, but anyway, um, just point being, uh, did this in like, you know, three hours. Um, you can deploy that to your iPhone and Android. Yeah, exactly. So I put it on my phone and goof around with that. But um, give you guys a quick just view of that. So, I mean, you end up with a main Lua file, and this will probably be just worth seeing real quick, but um, when you break out a project and start modularizing and doing like real coding, right, not just putting this one main.lua file together, um, you're going to want to start breaking your code out, and then uh, just like any other language, you can, you know, require in these other libraries and uh, separating out your code. And so that just give you at least a little bit of taste of, uh, you know, you can separate, open this up, you know, you can separate out all, all this code here is uh, just Lua and it just handles uh, everything to do with my rules. Um, and so there's some event handlers and uh, setting up the scene and cleaning up after itself and destroying objects and all that kind of stuff. So. so I some syntax similar to like HTML5 Canvas or like SVG or? Uh, no, it'd be closer to like SVG type stuff and um, then I would just say reference like Box2D and, and whatever you could draw in there or you could make show up here. And so you can do it a couple different ways. You can do it, you know, plotting and setting in the points and having it draw everything or you can do, um, you know, pulling images. Um, so you got a couple different options there. Um, what else? Any other questions, Lua or otherwise? Um, I'll throw up. You mentioned seeing a little more around the physics or whatever, so I'll just well, give uh, you guys a little quick. Can I ask too? I mean, I guess I'm guessing the support for like uh, REST APIs and, and such is probably pretty solid. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah. Any more of that? It's yeah, it's it's, it's baked in. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, there's a little function library out there. You require it in, and it's like, you know, call. Yeah, like our food fight app was backed by our SVG. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Steve can talk to that. I mean, how how fast did we have that hooked up and running once we yeah, set it up? Like five minutes. I mean. Oh right, right. The thing with the restaurants and yeah, compared to that, all the data backing is really good. Really good. Really good. Really good. Really good. Really good. And that was that was with Corona. No, that wasn't with Corona. The no. App, the app that on your phone that plays it. That's all in Corona, but there's uh, the site and all the data and stuff that's pulling from the wall. But, but that's what was so awesome. It was uh, me, Steve, Matt Steele, and um, 
Mike was part of our group, so it was the four of us. Um, I actually knew Mike before, but I'd never even met Steve or Matt, and we're just like, hey, let's do something, and we were playing around, and um, Steve's a master server side, uh, Heroku, Sinatra, all that stuff, and he, he wired that up. Um, I threw some stuff on the front end, and we're like, let's make it talk, and I think literally it was five minutes, and our stuff was connected and working together, so it was a non-issue. Um, sorry, I'm just getting, I was going to show you one more physics demo before we call it a wrap here. Um, I just got to open up from a different place. Um, is it under... So to your point of doing something physics-y related and seeing how much Lua it would take to pull that off, uh, you can see this little sample right here. Uh, these are all just image files. We have this one Lua file. We'll crack this open. Um, how many lines of code is this down here? We're up to 271. The samples we just ran through that I put together, you guys, we were like 222. So this is 271. And if we go over here and we run this, uh, open, I gotta get out to it from here. Uh, program, Corona, sample, physics, um, egg breaker. So this is, you know, an example. Uh, this would work on Nook, Fire, iPhone, iPad, Android, um, all those. Um, so we'll tap screen to launch. So, it, you know. And, and you must have set it so that that bolt is always the same spot on the window. Uh, right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, this is just a, a quick sample, so yeah, it's, it's loading the same way each time, but you could start putting in, you know, random and doing whatever, but, um, you know, I can start it here, and something different happens, and here, something different happens, uh, so here, something different happens, uh, and then we can just reset it. So there's there's your uh, there's a physics example in 200 lines, but that's the, that's really the power of what Lua brings for these game engines. Who's extending this, right? Like I want to I want to spend my time writing this part of it. I don't want to write the game engine and other APIs and all this. So I'll take advantage of the Unities and the Coronas out there and the other tools. And if they can let me script out and pull this off, then you know it's certainly a viable option. So um, so that's really it, guys. I mean. We can stick around more questions. We can raffle off uh, the drawing there, Jay, or however you want to divvy those up. Feel free. Thanks a lot.